Hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jim. Today's episode 231, and we're going to be interviewing Kat. How are you today, Kat? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well. I'm, uh, as usual, excited to do this. So let's get started. Tell me about your childhood. How was uh, growing up for you? Uh, growing up was definitely interesting. Uh, I grew up in Vermont, which is a very small town type state. It's actually one of the smallest states in the U.S. And um, I had three siblings, um, divorced parents, and my mother was also an addict, so I come by it honestly. And my dad had untreated PTSD from being in the military. So it ended up being a really rough situation where um, my dad was like physically and emotionally abusive. Uh, he is since in therapy and doing much better now, you know, so that's a gift from God for sure. Um, yeah, that must have been hard mother, growing up with two parents going through those two separate things. Both of those are hard. Yeah, no, I, um, whenever I explain it to people nowadays, I, I talk about how my parents were babies having babies, right? Like my mother was actually 16 when she got pregnant with my older sister. And she was only 18 when I was actually born. And then my dad was two years older than her. And because they both were raised in religious homes, they felt that that meant getting pregnant meant that they had to get married. And then my dad felt that because he had children and a wife to provide for, he had to go into the military because that was his only way to be able to do that in his mind. So it definitely set off a chain of events that was quite intense. Uh, to be perfectly honest. I mean, they're great people. I love my parents, but it was a struggle for sure. Um, my dad did end up getting remarried after the divorce when I was about five. And I will say that my stepmom was a light in my life. She's an absolute saint to be dealing with him every day. And um, But she helped me to understand that not everybody had to go through what I was going through and that what I was going through also wasn't necessarily okay. Um, so she, she helped me a lot on my journey to understanding that, you know, things can improve and should improve and that, you know, I was worthy of that. It took me a long time to internalize that. So I, when I was a teenager, I was suicidal. Um, and I started using actually when I was eight, um, started drinking was I when I was eight and got on drugs by the time I was ten, and then you, started, you that, said you started drinking at eight. Mm -hmm. So who first introduced you to alcohol? So that was family. Um, we had the French side of my family had uh, spritzers at New Year's, right? And then the Mexican side of my family had tequila at Christmas. And so I had both sides of my family had alcohol as part of their holiday traditions. And that was where I first became introduced to that. And then, um, you know, like they always say in the big book and a whole bunch of other things is, you know, we tend to hit the ground running with stuff like that. And so once I was introduced in my family settings, I just socially found it wherever I could. That's such a young age to start drinking. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, my guys in my home group always joke because I came to the program so young, but I still had 20 years under my belt by the time I got here. So it's been a long road already. How old are you now? So right now, um, I'm 32, but I'm turning 33 in about a month. Okay. So what was your social life like growing up? Did your parents affect that at all? Because just the reason I ask that is I've heard sometimes people say I was too embarrassed to have friends come to the house and things like that. Um, so I had two different households, right? Being a child of divorce. Um, when I, up until the age of, I think about 12, 11 or 12, I lived with my mother, um, like I would actually steal weed from her stash, right? And so my friends liked coming over to my house because my mom was like the fun mom. She like she wasn't um, overbearing or controlling. She really let us be kind of like free range kids. And um, 
but also just because of the way life was at home with her being an addict, I was out of the house a lot. I was running around. I was very extroverted. I was outside a lot. I didn't stay home very often. Um, and then when I went to my dad's, uh, I ended up actually triggering his PTSD in some type of way. He thought I was like a pathological liar and I needed to be set straight. And so for the three years that I lived with him, I was actually perpetually grounded and I wasn't allowed to have friends over. Um, so my social life was only at school during those years. So that definitely did affect me. And it wasn't necessarily that I didn't want people coming around. It was more that it just wasn't allowed. Um, and then there was a situation, a physical situation, which led to me basically running away. At the end of those three years, I ended up back at my mother's. And again, I just spent all of my time outside of the house. I had a little brother to help raise at that point. My little, my first little brother is 10 years younger than me. And so when I went back to her house, I focused on being there for my little brother. I got a part-time job. Uh, and But my friends still came over. They still knew my mom. They still liked my mom. And everybody kind of adopted my little brother as a mascot. So it didn't really affect my social life. But then uh, another situation happened there where um, she kicked me out. My dad said I wasn't welcome because by that time, my second little brother was born. And he didn't want me messing up my little brother. And so at that point, my grandparents ended up taking me in. And that's how I ended up in Minnesota from Vermont is at 16, they flew me out here to live with them because both of my parental situations weren't working out at that time. And I would say that that was really what affected my social life is, you know, when you move half the country away from everything, you know, at the age of 16, you know, it's a little rough. And um, so I was really depressed and I, I was still, I still always found friends. Um, and my, my grandparents are great. They always wanted my friends to come over. They'd rather me be home with my friends than out with my friends. Um, but yeah, it was an, it was an interesting journey where I've always been surrounded by people, uh, which was both great, but, and not great because it took a really long time for me to understand, to be quiet enough to understand that I had like a lot of shit going on in my head. And that's why I was using as heavily as I was so early on. Yeah. So silly question. You get good grades in school? Uh, most of the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I actually, anytime that I applied myself, I got really good grades. I was solidly like an A, B type student. But because of everything that was going on at home, there was a lot of attendance issues. And there was also... Uh, because the authority figures in my life growing up weren't reliable and respectable. I also, anytime I didn't like a teacher, I would fail their class on purpose. <laughs> or uh, there was one time I got put into AP biology and I felt that I was too stupid for that class. I didn't know why they put me in it. So I failed it on purpose because I was like, I don't belong here. And so a lot of my records at school were very intentional decisions to either do well or not do well, which is an interesting way to go through schooling, I'll tell you what. But I did graduate with A's and a decent GPA uh, by the time I was done with high school. So I know you said you got introduced to drinking at such a young age. Is alcohol your drug of choice? Yeah, it's the main one for sure. Um, alcohol tends to lead me down a path to to downers, though. Like when I was, um, basically, it was alcohol and weed in tandem full time. Um, and then, as far as like a drug of choice, like what would I seek out outside of those things? Uh, it was a lot of like anxiety meds and uh, muscle relaxers and painkillers. Uh, for a really long time, muscle relaxers was a huge problem for me because I also have a physical condition of chronic muscle tension. So for a really long time, I was in a lot of physical pain because I was so used to having those substances to help me out with it. Yeah. So what what was your alcohol and drug use like during school? Because you said you started, so were you, did you find any partners in crime? 
friends that you were doing? Oh, yeah. I basically always had a group of druggies around me. <laughs> like we were doing, you know, inhalants. Like, I mean, obviously being that young, like sniffing glue, stupid stuff like that. But then um, when we, when I got into middle school, that was when um, a lot of us were unsupervised enough that uh, we were able to find people willing to get us alcohol or parents at home that didn't lock up liquor cabinets. And we would always add stuff to our sodas. Like um, I, I remember it was my freshman year of high school and that entire year, my constant companion was a vanilla Coke with uh, half and half with vodka the whole year. <laughs> you said senior year of school? No, that was freshman year. Oh, freshman year. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear mm-hmm. you at first. That's crazy. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you, you got you got pretty heavy using early on. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was constant, really. Um, I remember there was one, there was one day in that same freshman year where I had to be sober that day. I didn't have anything, and they actually sent me to the nurse's office on suspicion of being on drugs because I was behaving so differently because I was detoxing. So it's like being drunk and being high was my baseline that they, when I was inebriated, that's when they thought I was good. And when I was detoxing, that's when they were like, Oh, there's something wrong with this child. Yeah. So what did you do once you graduated high school? Um, I just went straight into the workforce. Uh, I ended up where I was manic at that time, really bad. And I was ended, I ended up working, rotating for part-time jobs at a time went into retail went into waitressing and when, when um, you say manic are you bipolar uh no i so turns out i have complex ptsd from all of the stuff that i went through in childhood and so that but because it happens so early in life it manifests exactly the same as bipolar when you don't know what it is so basically um like three years ago, I went to therapy and told them I was bipolar because I had been diagnosed as bipolar when I was about seven years old. And he looked at me like I was crazy, the therapist. And uh, he was like, I don't think that's correct. And so he did a screening where they ask you all these questions to see where you rate on the indication scale. And uh, he goes, yeah, you're not bipolar. You have PTSD. You have complex PTSD so that when your triggers hit you, you regress to that state that you were when that trauma happened. So I was so a lot of times I was mentally regressing to the point of a like four to seven year old dealing with an abusive situation. And so I couldn't regulate my emotions because you don't know how to at that age. And so I got misdiagnosed as bipolar for many years because of that. But I do still go into manic states if I don't have control over what's going on in my mind and in my body. And that's where um, that's where using drugs and alcohol the way that I was, I was never in control. So I was always on that violent upswing, downswing, upswing, downswing. So right out of high school, that's where I was on that that manic energy is because I was completely out of control. <laughs> No, I know. I'm actually bipolar. So I know what it's like to be manic. I feel your mm. pain. Isn't that the worst when you just, uh, you make stupid decisions. You feel like you're on top of the world. You feel like nothing mm-hmm. you do is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, that specific manic swing. I got into a relationship with a real shitty guy. Uh, I was working my butt off. I don't know how I was doing it without uppers. Like, because that wasn't my doc at all but it amazes me to this day now i ended up going um i ended up homeless i ended up six thousand dollars in debt and i ended up losing all of my jobs (laughs) uh, coming down off of all of these crazy decisions i made during that during that manic phase um and coming off of a manic phase and dealing with all of those things you know that's that's where it's like you get suicidal and you just start drinking and drugging more because what's the point, right? Like it was, it's a rough thing to have to deal with those swings, especially when you're, you're not understanding what they are. Yeah. So what was your, your alcohol use like once you left high school? 
Um, it was pretty much daily. Every once in a while, I would go a couple of days not drinking, but that's because I was using drugs more. It's almost like I had this cycle where it's like I was either drinking a ton or using a ton of drugs. And then there oh. was like some overlap. I was the same exact way. I even said kidding around. I thought I was sober because I quit drinking. But all I did was I start I started snorting Adderall instead. Yep. Yep. Mine was um, you know, I would quit drinking for a little bit, but then I was constantly on Ritalin and um muscle relaxers or Molly I really got into for a while there. Where I wasn't drinking, but I was doing Molly like every other day. <laughs> did you did you like Molly's? No. Every every time I took it, I felt like I was gonna die. I felt like my heart was gonna burst, but I kept fucking doing it because you know I'm an addict. <laughs> like that's what we do. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, that is what we do. Mm -hmm. So, um, did you have once you left high school, you still had friends that you you said you always found a crowd to hang out with and drinking and drugging. So, what point do you think it became an addiction? So that, that might be go taking a step back, actually, because you started mm -hmm. at such a young age, at eight years old. <laughs> yeah, um, I would say the time it became an addiction was actually when I moved here um, because I was always surrounded by it in Vermont. Right. And so it was largely a social thing back in Vermont. But then I moved here to Minnesota and I told myself in my in my head, I was like, this is a fresh start. You're not around any of those old influences. You're not around any of those people that you used to do all this stuff with. So this is a fresh start. And what my definition of a fresh start was, no more hard drugs. And so I kept drinking. I kept smoking weed. And I just found those people that would that would be able to enable that for me here. Um, and so it's like when I was 16, I think 100% at that point it had developed into an addiction because I don't know how anyone who's not addicted and anyone who's even remotely sane could think a fresh start meant still drinking, still drugging, just not doing any of the hard stuff, like actual pills. And I didn't keep that anyway. By the time I was, by the time I was 19, I was back on pills. <laughs> back on what? Back on pills. So oh. muscle relaxers. And I did take Adderall for a minute there, but that didn't agree with me. No. I no, I went nuts. Oh, I went absolutely nuts. I had a I had a had a boyfriend at the time that was on Adderall and needed it, like actually needed it as a prescription. And uh, he gave me some because he was like, I want to see how this works for you. And I didn't stop moving for 14 hours. And by the time he came home, he had to physically hold me still and sit me on a couch. Wow. And so it's like anytime I wanted to deep clean the house, pop an Adderall. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how it does. Originally, they're good, they work, and then eventually they don't work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember he went through a cycle where the Adderall stopped working, and they actually had to switch him to Ritalin for a month to reset his system before he could back get back on the Adderall. So even people who need it get that same effect. Wow. So at what point did you think, like I know you said right now, Going back in hindsight, you think it was around 16 when you moved to Minnesota that you got addicted. What age did you actually recognize that? When did you actually one day say, holy shit, I'm addicted. I need this is no good. Honestly, it that thought process did not happen for me until the day of my last drunk. I was 29. Um, at no point. Like I always called, I called myself an addict before that point because of the pills. Cause I was like, well, addicts and junkies take pills. Um, but I never internalized that and believed it. I never actually took a look in the mirror and was like, this is a problem for you until, um, it was like March 29th, 2019. So I was 29 and, um, it was the day of my last drunk because it was my second DUI. I ended up in weekend lockup on my second DUI. And that was the first time I remember sitting there and just going like, how did I do this again? Because it was my, again, my second DUI. It wasn't my first one. First one didn't even matter to me. I didn't care at all. 
But then that second one, I sat in a solo jail cell in Bloomington, Minnesota for a whole weekend, just ruminating on my life. And something in my brain was finally like, what are you doing? The universe didn't put you here to sit in jail cells. You're fucking up the plan right now. And uh, so it was it was a long road. It was a long road to actually get to taking a hard look at myself and understanding what was happening. So once you took that hard look at yourself and you realized what was going on, at what point did you actually do something about it? Um, right away, technically, because the court system, I didn't have enough for bail and neither did my family. So the court system told me, you have to stay sober or we're going to put you back in jail as a conditional release. And so I had to breath test myself three times a day and I had to pay for the machine. And when I couldn't afford the machine anymore, I had to go downtown for random UAs. So I was doing that for about five months. And so I ended up having the Department of Justice be my higher power for a minute. And that kept me sober. Um, but then I was my lawyer told me, OK, we're looking at the finish line. And that was five months in, five months sober, because I had to be legally. And uh, I was staring down the finish line. They had light at the end of the tunnel for all my court stuff. And that was when I got terrified. That was when I decided to do something about it. And that's what brought me to the rooms of AA. Because um, I was I was already in a 12-step program, Al-Anon, for friends and family of alcoholics because the family member, my grandmother that I was living with is also an alcoholic. Um, but then I was like, okay, well, if Al-Anon is helping me with deal with my grandmother's issues, then AA is going to help me deal with mine. Uh, so it took, it took six months of being legally required to be sober before I was clear minded enough to be like, oh, okay, this is, this is something I need to deal with. Cause I was terrified. I was like, as soon as that court, system stop telling me to be sober i'm gonna go back out i was like i promise you i was like i cannot do this i cannot be sober without somebody else telling me to be sober and so it took five months of sobriety and a pretty egregious dui to get there so i was still 29 at that point and that was when i it was like october october of 2019 when i got into the rooms and started actually trying to work on it and how was that for you? How did you, when, what was your first meeting like? Oh, my first meeting was a disaster. Uh, I went to a speaker meeting and I think as a newcomer um, who wanted a solution, going to a speaker meeting that has over a hundred people and you're just a face in the crowd is not the forum. At least it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. Um, but I, I lucked out, you know, I really do think the universe provides for me in a very um, overt way because I, the first meeting I went to was at a recovery center and anybody who came as just some Joe Smo off the street that wasn't actually in their recovery program, they gave them the big book and the 12 and 12 for free because they were like, we're not sending you back into the world with no resources. Um, so I, the meeting itself was not great. I didn't get a chance to speak on my experience at all. I didn't get a chance to bond with anybody. It was just me sitting in a corner, listening to somebody else talk about, and it just so happened the speaker that night didn't have anything really in common with me. And so I didn't identify hardly at all, but they gave me a big book in the 12 and 12 and I went home with those. And so that's the blessing of that first meeting was I walked away with some resources that that led to me getting to my second meeting, which is to this day, my home group. Oh, awesome. So what did the big book in the 12 and 12 do for you when you first read them? Uh, well, I started with the big book and they, you know, they always say in all the meetings, you know, the first 165, like that's, that's where the meat of the program is. So I started reading and I love reading. I actually, my whole second bedroom is a library space because I have so many books. And so I dived right into the book and what it did was set off um, a rebellion reflex in me, right? And so I was reading, I was reading, so I was like, that's what I do anyway. But I was arguing out loud with the book. 
because I was going through court, didn't have a job, had to shut down my business. I had nothing better to do than read this book and argue with it. And so all the points where it tries to tell you how alcoholics behave, um, I was like, well, that's not me. You know, I don't do that. Like where it says it is, it is forever the dream of every alcoholic to drink like a normal man. And I was like, that's not me. I've always been trying to be fucked up. <laughs> like, like that was somehow made me different. Right. Yeah. And then I was like, you can't have just one drink what dinner. And I was like, well, I've done that before. That's not me. You know, cause I have, I have had one, one beer with dinner before. And then that's been it for that singular day. But that's like one day out of the entire year that I did that I was looking for those exceptions right um but then one night I was doing that same thing up late reading the book arguing out loud my partner was in bed trying to sleep because he's got a job and I woke him up with how passionately I was arguing with an inanimate object (laughs) and the look on his face I don't I can't even describe it to you but it was enough to slap me in the face a little bit to be like I am doing something wrong again this was another moment of clarity where I was like if I am arguing this passionately with this book disrupting this man's peace in the middle of the night and he's looking at me like that there's something in this book that I don't want to see there's something in this book that my brain is actively fighting against and that means that it's probably true because I have a problem with authority i have a problem with people trying to tell me things and so i took this book written by a bunch of men in the 30s like and i was like and i started to actively rebel against it and so seeing that behavior in me triggered an awareness that i I needed to fix it. Like there's, there's, I can't go through life arguing with books. Like it makes no sense. Like a sane person doesn't do that. Right. And so it's like what the big book did for me was point out my dysfunction in a very obvious way. (laughs) However it helps, it helped, right? Right. I mean, it did. All that matters is that end result. Mm Mm-hmm. So how exactly did you get sober? Was there any, did you go to detox? Did you go to rehab? Uh, so because I was legally obligated to stay sober or go back into jail, that was how I got sober. Um, but then at six months, in order to celebrate, I relapsed on drugs. Uh, so that, and that was the turning point where I actually started working the program where I actually read the big book to understand it and to implement it and I had my home group and I had a sponsor at that time as well so I hid it I hid it from my sponsor for 30 days I was like I want to get my 30 days back before I tell anybody and so I slipped it in the conversation like she wasn't going to notice and she noticed and she made me reset my date and I went and I owned up to it at my home group and that was that was where my new sobriety date in September came from. And that was when I started actually listening. I tried to, I tried to listen more than I was talking. Um, I'm not good at that. I'm still not great at that. It takes a lot of hard work for me to listen, but that, so I would say, so it was September of 2019 where I actually started making progress and I actually started working on that. So what's life been like for you ever since you got sober? Gosh, it's been, it's been a wild ride. It's been so interesting. It's been different than I ever could have imagined. I, um, so I had to shut down my business when I was dealing with the court stuff. I started donating plasma just to pay my lawyer. And then I got into the program and I started participating in the fellowship right i got a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of phone numbers to call text hang out with um i was actively doing sponsorship work and then covid hit and all of that went out the window right i mean hell they shut down our alanons and um but all i did from the beginning was try to show up was try to be sober 
and to show up when I said I was going to show up because that's one of the things the program talks about is becoming a reliable source, like doing that living amends. And so every day I went to, not every day, every day I woke up and I tried to show up and then about every other day I went to meetings. And um, I got a job at a hotel, which was a good enough job for the time. And then that job led me to uh, senior living. And that was an amazing job. And I quickly became the supervisor there. And then uh, I actually got recruited by Lifetime, where I work now. And uh, I was promoted within six months there and into the role that I'm in now. And so since I've been sober, I have moved out of my family's house. I have paid back all of my debts. I got my, I actively worked on um, my debt to the point where I actually got my credit score into the 700s, which is wild because I thought that was never in the cards for me. So I'm, I'm financially stable. I have my own place. I have a dog, a cat. I have a partner that we're in the planning stages of a commitment ceremony. So it's like a for life deal. <laughs> um, and I, I've developed a community around me that not only do they show up for me, but I show up for them. Um, it's been transformative to be sober and to show up. Like one of the, one of the really big indicators that my life has changed is um, I have this grandma, this adorable, sweet little grandma that prays for me all the time, right? And uh, when I was struggling, when I was going through it, she would, she never told me she prayed for me. She just did, right? And now, um, not that long ago, she told me, we we're on the phone, we we're talking, just having a good time. And she told me, well, you know what? Prayer works. She was like, all of my prayers have come to be answered. Like, you are doing so well, and I'm so proud of you. And it's like, to, from my grandma to go from hiding her prayers from me because she was so worried to on the phone, just acknowledging that she thinks that all of those prayers weren't in vain was such a huge thing. And now I'm going to get emotional because <laughs> grandma makes me. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lost my grandparents young. I wish I still had my grandparents around. So what's life like for you now? Yeah, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to have them. Yes, it is. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. um, what's life like for you nowadays, now that you're sober? How's it treating you? It's treating me well. You know, I, uh, I've i got, like I said, I've got my own place. I've got a, a loving, supportive partner who doesn't give me a hard time for being in meetings all the time. Um, I've got a great job. I actually just took a trip to Florida to see my mother's side of the family. And um, that went really well. Every single aunt and uncle and my mother and my brother and my cousins, all of them commented on how good it was to see me happy. And well, I was a very angry and depressed kid. And so for all of them to see me now, to see me sober and happy, like that's how life's treating me. Other people see what has improved in me even when they're not in my every day. And it's like, I haven't, I hadn't seen that family since my last DUI. It was actually directly after my last DUI that I saw them last. And then I just popped into their, their lives for a week out of nowhere. And every single one of them, that's what they said, was that it was good to see me happy. So every day I am grateful for this journey. Every day I'm grateful to this program. Uh, life is still hard. You know, life isn't easy. But it's more manageable simply because I'm not numbing myself to it all the time. What I tell people when they ask me, what, like, what has the program and being sober done for me is it's kept me awake enough to live my life. Because what I was doing before wasn't living. It was existing. And now every day I get to wake up and I get to have a good life because I'm awake enough to make it good. And I trust my higher power and my fellowship enough to reach out for help when I need it. Cause I could never reach out for help before. And it's, it's just, 
it's just easier. It's just brighter. I can breathe. I'm not depressed. I'm not anxious. Um, I can't say enough good things about life and sobriety, honestly. Good. I'm happy for you. That's awesome that you're doing so well. So I got one last Thank question you. for you. Do you have any advice for people that are watching and listening? Oh, any advice? I think my advice would be to stick with it. Whatever you're trying to do right now, if you're trying to get sober, if you're struggling, if you're trying to get through anything hard, like always put one foot in front of the other. Because as long as you're moving, you'll get somewhere different. The only time that things are hopeless is when you you stop trying. So you always got to try. And it's going to seem insurmountable. But even baby steps are still steps. Inching forward is better than not doing anything at all. So that's my advice is to just keep going. Because you're not going to see it. You're not going to get there if you don't try, if you don't keep moving. Yeah. Well, how do you feel? We're, we're just at the end of the interview now. How are you feeling? Did you enjoy our time together? I did. I'm feeling very emotional. <laughs> but I did. It was it was great. Great spending this time with you. Thank you for having me on and giving me this opportunity. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you for doing it. I mean, I obviously I can't do this without people coming on and willing to share their stories. So did you have anything else that you want to add in? I think just thank you again. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for what you're doing. Podcasts like this, things like this, the resources we have at our fingertips, it's insane to, it's insane to see as someone who grew up when in, the internet started being a thing in households and to see what it is today. Uh, people like you that are doing stuff like this that have this available for people like me <laughs> it's it's a beautiful thing it's an amazing thing that you're doing and so thank you for that thank you it means a lot to me it really does i i just want people to be able to get their story out but also people listen to it and let them know that they're not alone that's the most important thing i think that's what the most i think that's yeah. the most touching thing a story does because for me when i first went to rehab the second those guys started telling their stories, I was like, holy shit, I'm not alone. Because when you're in addiction, you feel like it's you're the mm -hmm. only one this has happened to. You know what I mean? And then you hear other people's stories and it really makes mm -hmm. you realize you're not the only one and that there is a way out. Yeah. So, do me a favor. I agree. Yeah. No, absolutely. There's. Um, yeah, I agree also. So sit tight for a second. And for everybody that's watching and listening, if you like what you saw and heard, go below and give us a like. Also subscribe to see when we upload new videos. You can also check us out on all social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you name it, we're on it. Uh, as far as resources, we have our website, which is www.addicts-anonymous.com. There you'll find plenty of free resources as well as free literature. Um, Addicts Anonymous also has a book, hopefully coming out by the end of this month, if not uh, sometime next month, hopefully mid next month at the latest. It's called Addicts Anonymous, Our Stories. It's a collection of essays, as well as some people's stories that they wrote for the book. So I hope you enjoyed today. And until next time.